with the war. Thank you. We begin by greeting you all with the warmest of Islamic welcomes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Greetings to all of our guests. Welcome to the History of Medicine in Islam event with historian Hassan Munir. My name is Safiya Malik. And my name is Maz Haq. And we will be your co-host this evening on behalf of the Muslim Medical Association of Queens and the What Happened in Medicine Historical Society interest groups. We're going to begin with the land acknowledgement. We are virtually gathered across several traditional territories of which we as hosts are located on the territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, Neutral and Mississauga peoples and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. We are also representing Queen's University which is located in Cataraqui, Kingston, Ontario, on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. For those of us who are settlers and uninvited guests of Turtle Island, we must reflect upon the continued ties of Indigenous peoples to these lands. We must actively rectify current practices and policies of colonialism, imperialism, and anti-Indigenous racism within Canada, of which settlers are continued beneficiaries. As we are gathered to learn about one under a narrated history, it is important we remember another history that binds us all together within this land known as Canada. Please take some time now to reflect on why we acknowledge these lands. Please take some time after this webinar to look into current Indigenous activism, including ongoing land back campaigns across Ontario and Turtle Island. To learn more about whose land you are on, please visit www.native-land.ca. Now, Sister Safi and I are both a part of the Muslim Medical Association of Queens, which is a branch of the broader Muslim Medical Association of Canada. The MMAQ, the Muslim Medical Association of Queens, aims to support and inform both Muslim medical students as well as the broader Kingston community through advocacy, workshops, seminars, and social events. Over there at the bottom, you see our email. If you have any questions or concerns about this or any future events, feel free to reach out to us at queens at muslimmeds.ca. I'd like to introduce our second co-host organization, which is the What Happened in Medicine Historical Society. It's an interest group at Queen's School of Medicine that is interested in exploring the history of medicine. WIM runs a number of events throughout the school year, including an annual History of Medicine Week, as well as QMED's favorite tradition, a History of Medicine field trip. Now on to the schedule for the evening, and it should be pretty straightforward. After we wrap up, wrap up with these introductions and a short recitation of the Quran, which is the Islamic holy book, we'll move on to our keynote speaker for, the, for tonight, who is Brother Hassan Munir. And he will be, of course, informing us all about the history of medicine in Islam. After that, we'll have a short break, followed by a Q&A moderated by Sister Safia, and with that, the conclusion of the event. A couple quick notes before we begin our session. There's going to be two ways for you to ask questions, which will be answered at the end. The first is you can send your questions using the Google form that's linked over here, the tinyurl.com slash history with the capital H, Q, capital Q, and a lowercase s. We'll also put this link in the chat. You can also send your questions directly to anyone who's listed as a host. Disclaimer, um, anything that's presented today should not be taken as uh, health information or as a clinical decision-making tool. Please refer to a trusted health practitioner. Thank you. Now we move on to the recitation of the Quran because we got to kick this event off in the right way. To recite and provide context to the verses, we're blessed to have Hussam Hilal with us today. Hussam Hilal is an Imam and Youth Education and Counseling Manager at ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. And I invite him now to get us started. Salam, warm greetings, hello everybody. My Muslim brothers and sisters, people of other traditions and faiths, welcome. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to be reciting, inshallah, from Surah Al-Hashr. I'll be doing the Arabic, and then I'll ask maybe Maaz to do the English, and then I'll do the context of the verses. A'udhu billahi minash rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim 
يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله ان الله خبير بما تعملون ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فانساهم انفسهم اولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي اصحاب النار واصحاب الجنه اصحاب الجنه هم الفائزون لو انزلنا هذا القران على جبل لرايته خاشعا لرايته خاشعا متصدعا من خشيه الله وتلك الامثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا اله الا هو عالم الغيب والشهاده هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا اله الا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الاسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والارض وهو العزيز الحكيم Now, as the first verse is actually missing in the English, so if you don't mind, I'll begin with the fir- very first verse, and then you can do the rest of the translation. So, verse eighteen: O believers, be mindful and conscious of God, and let every one of you look at what you've prepared for tomorrow, and remember Allah, remember God, be conscious of God, for certainly Allah is aware of all that you do. And do not be like those who forgot Allah, so He made them forget themselves. It is they who are truly rebellious. The residents of the fire cannot be equal to the residents of paradise. Only the residents of paradise will be successful. Had we sent down the Quran upon a mountain, you would have certainly seen it humbled and torn apart in awe of Allah. We set forth such comparisons for people, so perhaps they may reflect. He is Allah. There is no God worthy of worship except Him. Knower of the seen and unseen, He is the most compassionate, most merciful. He is Allah. There is no god except Him, the King, the Most Holy, the All Perfect, the Source of Serenity, the Watcher of all, the Almighty, the Supreme in Might, the Majestic. Glorified is Allah far above what they associate with Him in worship. He is Allah, the Creator, the Inventor, the Shaper. He alone has the most beautiful names. Whatever is in the heaven and the earth constantly glorifies Him, and He is the Almighty, All Wise. Thank you, Maz. Before I begin with a very quick, res- a very quick uh, reflection on the verses, I want us to just, if you can, close your eyes. If you can't, imagine that your eyes are closed, and I want you to imagine that you have nothing else in this world. That you've lost everything. You have literally nothing but you. You've lost everything that you own. Now I want you to take your imagine in 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 the moment of realizing that you you don't have anything. Take your hand. And put it close to your chest, and listen to the beat of your heart. Every one of those beats, I want to just imagine. Here, try to take in every one of those beats. This is an exercise that is done. You can open your eyes, by the way. It's an exercise that is done by Muslim um, thinkers when we're training in Islamic tradition and theology. 
to reflect on the idea of having. What does it mean to have? And the purpose of this exercise is to get us to remember that even if we have nothing else, the gift of every heartbeat is enough to be grateful. Because the gift of life, every heartbeat that comes, that's an opportunity to reflect, to be aware, to think, to build, whatever it is that I'm able to work and do and all my ambitions, my desires, my goals, that is not achievable. Those are not achievable if my heart is not beating. So remember, if you're looking for a reason to be grateful, that is a constant reminder of why you should be grateful. If everything else is gone, why you should still be grateful. Now, the verses that we recited from Surah Al-Hashr, they're very powerful because um, before these verses were revealed, there were two individuals named Umar and Muawiyah. And they were very good individuals. But before they became Muslim, they were chilling as young people growing up together. And they met each other to have a question or to have a discussion. What are your goals? What are your ambitions in life? And both of them said, you know what? My ambition, Umar said, is to have a nice house, a comfortable living, financial autonomy, independence. I want to have my own goats, my own camel, my own sheep, so I don't have to rely on anybody else. Back then in the desert, that's what financial autonomy meant. Now, Muawiyah said something very similar. I want to have my own capacity to, you know, have financial control over my time, my energy, things like that. Now, they became Muslim, and a couple of years after this verse was revealed, they met again, and they asked each other the same questions. And they said, now our ambitions have completely shifted. It's not about us anymore. It's not about having a financial, secure, nice place. It's not, it's not about that anymore. It's about, Omar said, I want to be able to take this gift that God has given me, the gift of guidance, and share it with as many people around me as possible. And Muawiyah said the same thing. He said, I want to take the gift of management. I'm a good manager. I'm a good leader. And I want to be able to use that to channel justice and to channel truth to as many people as possible. And that shows the transformation that a Muslim should have, the constant thought about legacy. I don't have to leave a legacy because I want to be remembered. No, I have to leave a legacy because every heartbeat is a gift that I have to be grateful for. And the least that I can do is give back to the world around me and the people around me and the people that are around me. Give something, do something to show the gratitude. Even if I have nothing else, the fact that I've lived that my heart beat even for a few moments. That is a gift that is worthy of gratitude. And the best way to express that gratitude is the Quran tells us, implement and show your gratitude through your action. Give back, pay it forward. Now what's incredible is this verse or these verses that we recited here were among the verses that Ibn Sina reflects on in his Kitab al-Shifa, the healing, and Ibn Nafis reflect on as being very, very instrumental in guiding them and in catalyzing their journey and their quest to be great physicians. Now with that, I'm going to ask you, Maas, to take a forward from here, or uh, Sophia, uh, or Sophia, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, and inshallah introduce our keynote. Jazakumullah khairan again for the opportunity. Thank you for giving me the chance to be here. Keep smiling, stay safe, and Allah bless all of you. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair, Hussain Hilal, for the beautiful recitation and explanation. Pick, uh, wonderfully intertwine that with uh, our topic for today, inshallah. And so we can move on to that. As a Muslim, learning about Muslim history has always been something I've enjoyed. Whether it was the origins of Islam, the golden age of Islam, or prominent figures who wore Islam on their sleeves, like Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. But what is it that makes history worth learning? Specifically Islamic history. Why should we learn each other's history? As a Muslim, learning about Islamic history gives me pride and a deeper understanding of my identity. I think to the fact that many historical Islamic figures prayed like me. When they prayed, they faced the same direction as me. They recited the same verses of the Quran as me, and it shows me, wow, that's what a Muslim is capable of. There seems to be an unsaid intrinsic false notion that is forming in the modern day. And that is that Islam holds us back from being great in this world. And for this reason, we may find ourselves hiding our Islam and Islamic identity. 
we may ask, how can I get a good night's sleep if I have to wake up for prayer? What will my boss think of me if I leave for Friday prayers? How can I function well if I'm fasting? How can I get rich if I need to pay my zakat every year? But learning about these Muslims throughout history, you find that they weren't successful despite their Islam. Rather, it was their Islam that propelled them forward, gave them direction, and they represented their faith proudly. I'm inspired to improve in my practicing of Islam as becoming a better Muslim is my key to being great in whatever I aspire towards. I eagerly await this talk to obtain yet another burst of inspiration to see what Muslims over the years have contributed to the world of medicine. But today for this event, we also have many friends of other faiths with us, and it's important to ponder what they can extract from today. Throughout our schooling here in Canada, we study history extensively. But whose history is it? We learn about the world wars, the great explorers like Jacques Cartier, prominent figures such as Tommy Douglas, and other details about the Western world. And maybe rightfully so, as that is a large part of Canada's history. However, in having such a Eurocentric focus on history, we neglect the contributions of other societies, and we begin to assume that society was built here in the West. This then begets things like xenophobia, racism, and feeling that people of the West are inherently superior. However, it is through the learning the history of other cultures and people that we gain an appreciation for who they are today. It's how we obtain the realization that they aren't new faces. Rather, they're instrumental to the makeup of our society an integral part of its grassroots. Learning about people's history gives us value to who they are today. For this reason, I highly commend all of you for joining today, whether it's, whether it's to learn a piece of your own history or whether it's to be more informed about the history of those around you and to gain an appreciation for the breadth of experiences which have shaped our culture here in Canada today. With that, we will move on to our keynote speaker. Brother Hassan Munir has, com has completed a BA in History and Communication Studies from York University and is pursuing an MA in Mediterranean and Middle Eastern History from UFT. He is also the Public Relations Manager and a Research Fellow at the Yafin Institute of Islamic Research. In October of 2017, he was recognized by Heritage Toronto as an emerging historian of the city. So please give a warm Zoom welcome to Brother Hassan Munir. Um, Jazakallah khair, uh, Maaz, assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, peace be with you all and thank you for joining this program. Uh, like Maaz mentioned, um, and I hope that uh, my contribution, like the contribution of everyone else, uh, including Imam Hussam and the organizers um, and uh, the audience, and uh, we'll all come together and make this a great learning experience for all of us. Um, I do have slides uh, to share with you, um, and uh, hopefully that will add a bit more um, life to the presentation. So let me try to make that happen. Um, so this is like, as you can imagine, this is an, it's an enormous topic. Right, and um, I think over the past few days, as I've been trying to put together this presentation, I've learned so much about medicine that I'm, you know, seriously considering applying to med school right now. I think I'm I'm pretty much ready for it. Um, and but but the topic was was vast, and the reason for that uh, being that for many other subjects, as they are developed through history. Um, they're not that important. They're not, they don't have the same universal importance that medicine has, right? So for example, a culture could produce something on astronomy, but maybe like people in another culture uh, don't necessarily uh, you know, care much for astronomy. But medicine, because we're all trying to live our best lives possible is something that is sort of universally appreciated. And that means two things. First of all, medical knowledge, um, spreads uh, very fast and very far. And secondly, um, that there's many, uh, and as part of that, I guess, that there's many copies made of medical texts, there's many editions, there's, it's always like reproduced because of how necessary it is to disseminate that knowledge uh, to different places, et cetera. Um, and so for that reason, when we talk about the, the uh, many legacies uh, that we receive, um, not just as a Muslim community, but as a uh, global community from Islamic civilization, 
um, medicine is one of the ones that we are best aware of. Um, and so the reason I mentioned that is because really in this um, short time that we have, about an hour, there's, there's going to be so many things that I would like to discuss, um, but I won't be able to go into very much detail and we'll really just be scratching the surface. But my purpose in designing this presentation was to give you as broad and as interesting of an overview as possible to give you some names, to give you some key concepts that you can take away uh, with you and then do further research on your own or reach out to me and I can sort of guide you afterwards with further reading materials on any of these uh, particular topics that I discuss within this presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, the place that where we start um, and how we proceed is um, generally chronological and that's the order I'm going to try to follow as much as possible. Um, and uh, hopefully that'll make uh, sense and, and be very clear about how things progress from one stage um, to the next. So this is just an artistic representation, by the way, this is from one of the exhibits on the history of science um, uh, or the history of Islamic science. And we'll be talking about um, how what's represented in this picture, um, how much of it is uh, true and, and accurate, we can say, and which parts or which aspects of it may be misleading. And, and, and really, it's important that we have a honest review of history, of course, um, despite the incredible contributions of Muslims uh, to this field. It's not going to be as rosy and as perfect of a picture as we sometimes imagine it to be. And that's just uh, the human uh, experience, the collective human experience in any aspect of life. Uh, and medicine as a profession um, or the experience of patients and any of that is just a small part of that. Um, what do we mean when we say the Islamic medical tradition? Like where is it drawing from? What uh, inflows produced this tradition uh, once the Islamic uh, faith and the Islamic tradition uh, appeared on the scene uh, about 1400 years ago? So first of all, we had um, prophetic medicine. Um, which is a genre called Tib al-Nabawi, which we'll talk about a bit. This is generally guidance uh, from the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, in terms of what uh, people can do to um, either uh, you know, cure themselves of particular kinds of illnesses or injuries, um, or what they can do to uh, generally stay healthy and to stay strong um, and, and those kinds of things. The second uh, inflow was coming from the folk medicine of different cultures. And this has shifted and this has changed throughout history and um, throughout the many different cultures around the world, of course. Um, and this is so important to appreciate because uh, with our advanced kind of knowledge of medicine um, that we have today, alhamdulillah, um, that we're very grateful for, um, it's, it's sometimes um, easy to fall uh, into the, the blind spot of uh, looking at folk medicine and its contribution in human history uh, in, in sort of like a derogatory way. Um, but, but really the vast majority, like it's, it's no exaggeration, the vast majority of healing and the vast majority of uh, healthy living that has happened in human history is most likely due to uh, folk medicine, like your, your, your local uh, doctors who had like a very basic understanding of what herbs can be used, um, you know, what kind of basic uh, consumables can be produced like teas and foods, et cetera, that will help you when you have a fever, uh, what kind of ointment can be prepared to put on your leg if you have a cut, that sort of thing. So if you watch like Earthogrow, for example, and you've gotten far enough, like these are the Artuk Bay types who have they have some basic education, um, but really um, they are relying upon their local experiential knowledge and doing the best that they can with the limited resources available in a lot of places. Um, the third place uh, that was influencing the Islamic medical tradition um, was uh, the Yunani uh, tradition or the Greek uh, tradition, especially via Hippocrates and Galen. Um, and of course, I'm assuming those of you who are medical students here are already somewhat familiar with these names, so I won't go into like a lot of details about the Greek 
uh, tradition or its uh, background, but one key element of that that really persisted throughout um, the trajectory of the Islamic medical tradition was uh, humorism, this concept of the four humors in the body and their relation to the four uh, elements in nature and how many illnesses um, and disorders and injuries and, and many things of this sort were um, seen through the lens of this concept of humorism that there was an imbalance of humor, of humor sorry, produced inside the human body, which was the reason that this illness was occurring. And so conversely, to resolve the problem, uh, the, the balance of the humor somehow had to be restored. And that was like uh, the focus of much of the practice of the Islamic medical tradition. Um, of course, you know, this is now an outdated concept. Um, and we have a much, much better understanding of the complexity uh, of the many different systems and the many different aspects uh, of the human body. Um, but again, the, the contribution that this uh, baseline tradition uh, made to centuries of healing and healthy living is something to be appreciated. Uh, similarly, for the Indo-Persian tradition, and it's it's really a mix of the Persian tradition, the Central Asian med uh, medical tradition, uh, as well as a very long-standing and interesting, very unique Indian uh, tradition of medicine. And these had sort of come together in a place called the Academy of Gundishapur, which is now in Iran. Um, and this was basically like an institution, a center of learning, uh, where people from across the, the different regions, it was sort of a midway point where people from uh, the Persian sphere and the Central Asian sphere and the Indian sphere would all come together and discuss knowledge um, and sort of a precursor to the, the house of wisdom, the Beit al-Hikmah that will later develop in the city of Baghdad. Um, and this is uh, where much of the knowledge that then informed the early Muslim physicians and researchers was first produced. So it came from this center of learning to other centers of learning established by the Muslims. So the Indo-Persian tradition, we can call it for lack of a better term, through the Academy of Gundishapur is another very important uh, source of information. And then finally, the contributions of the Islamicate medical professionals and researchers themselves. Now, I wanna talk just momentarily about this uh, term Islamicate, right? Because uh, some of you may not be familiar with it. It's a term that was uh, really pushed forward by um, one of the leading historians of the Islamic or Islamicate, as he would say, world, whose name was Marshall Hodgson. Um, and, and really what uh, he was trying to say or, or conceptualize by using this term is that um, you know, it can be misleading if you say, uh, let's say um, that something is Islamic, that it has necessarily to do with the religion or um, exclusively with the practitioners of the religion. So exclusively something that is Islam uh, or something that is from Muslims. Um, and of course, society was much more complex than that. And we'll see many examples of that. Uh, many ideas were coming from non-Islamic sources. Many of the medical professionals, the researchers were not Muslims themselves. Even some of those who we sometimes tend to assume were Muslim, um, there's, there's some reason to be a bit skeptical about that sometimes. And we'll discuss that as well, right? So um, it was an Islamic society in the sense that its roots its cultural roots were in Islam. That's what made it distinctive. That's what made it emerge, right? And, you know, medicine was sort of a sub uh, aspect of that overall culture. And so we can say Islamic medical professionals and researchers, which could include non-Muslims, which in could include a lot of non-Muslim or un-Islamic concepts, et cetera, all coming together uh, under this uh, general um, cultural environment culture of learning that was encouraged and inspired and produced by uh, the teachings of Islam. So that's something to keep in mind. I'll be constantly using this word uh, Islamicate as well. So starting with Tib al-Nabawi, which is uh, Tib means medicine and al-Nabawi means uh, prophetic, uh, referring to Prophet Muhammad, who is the founder of uh, the religion uh, of Islam as we know it. And so uh, Tib al nabawi was, as the name suggests, his uh, tradition of medicine. Um, and uh, those of us who are Muslim are probably already somewhat familiar with uh, some of the things that he 
uh, recommended or that we know from uh, the details of his life, which we know, um, such as uh, using black seed um, and uh, its importance uh, in the Islamic tradition as part of the cure for you know, many different uh, illnesses and ailments, um, such as drinking uh, nabid, which is uh, essentially like, um, uh, like fruit, uh, you know, when you, when you put like dates in the water and, and let, the, let it like mix a bit um, overnight and then uh, consume the water after, which is something nowadays we do with berries. There's like a term for it, which is completely escaping me. Sorry. And, um, but, and then physical exercises uh, such as swimming, uh, which we have uh, some indications the prophet did uh, with his companions, with his friends, uh, such as archery, which is a form of, um, you know, uh, physical exercise that he encouraged, uh, such as running. We know there are many narrations that the prophet, peace be upon him, raced with his wife, Aisha. So racing was something um, that uh, the prophet did, right? So all of these things are uh, kind of some elements, some aspects of this overall uh, genre, uh, this body of knowledge known as Tib al Nabawi. And the contributors to this genre uh, included both um, people who specialized in uh, the Islamic uh, traditional uh, disciplines as well as uh, medical knowledge of the time. So the first two examples in this list are examples of medical knowledge Abdul Latif al Baghdadi, uh, Kahal ibn Tarhan. These are both um, practitioners of medicine. And then the, the latter three are uh, some of the most, you, know, you may recognize these names, some of the very, very prominent, um, uh, you know, um, experts in the Islamic disciplines, Imam al-Dahabi, Imam ibn al-Qayyim, Imam al-Suyuti. And it's very interesting that um, all of these three authors that are particularly mentioned here uh, tried to synthesize medical knowledge into the, um, information that they received from the traditional sources about uh, what the Prophet وسلم, recommended in terms of um, medicine and healthy living. So they weren't just relaying the information, but they were trying to, uh, you know, um, uh, trying to explain the information uh, through the medical knowledge that was available to them through the works of people like Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi and Kahal ibn Tarhan. So there was a cohesive effort to bring both sides of the picture together. Now there's narrations from the Prophet which are very interesting, things that he said, and I'll, I'll share two of them, but there's many that have to do with healthcare. One of the things he said was that, O oh, servants of Allah, seek treatment. Indeed, Allah did not place a disease, but that he also placed his treatment or cure, except for one ailment, which he elaborated and said was old age. Right. And, and, and so like you can imagine what this kind of statement encourages someone who has an interest in um, pursuing a career in medicine at any point in Islamic history. Like, oh, servants of Allah, seek treatment. First of all, the Prophet is encouraging anyone who needs treatment to seek treatment. And secondly, he is encouraging, um, uh, implicitly encouraging uh, people who have an inclination to work in this field that there is a treatment or a cure for every single disease that you will ever come across, except for aging. But for everything else, there is a treatment or cure. So whether it's 100 uh, years after him, whether it's three or five or seven centuries after him, whether it's 14 centuries after his time today, and we're still looking for the cures or the treatments for many illnesses, the inspiration is there in this statement to continue looking because Allah has placed it and it's on us to strive to discover it for the benefit of humanity. Um, another very important uh, narration uh, that again, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, he said this, which is that whoever practices medicine without any prior knowledge of medicine will be held liable, right? Will be held accountable. So there's accountability. You can't just, um, and even in seventh century Arabia, he's saying, um, despite the reliance on folk medicine and uh, many kinds of interesting traditions, uh, that were prevalent at the time, uh, you have to have firm knowledge. You have to have some uh, experience. You cannot just go around um, loosely, you know, prescribing things and trying things and um, doing things without having any sort of grounding in this field. So again, it's encouragement to actually pursue the field uh, professionally, to learn, to learn the best knowledge that's available at any point in history 
to seek the best knowledge of medicine that's available to you know um, make sure that when we are held accountable, we are um, able to you know our sincerity uh, sort of uh, will speak for itself. And an example that we came across earlier this year um, of the sort of extensive um, uh, kind of contribution and inspiration of the the Tib al Nabawi. Uh, genre in its broadest form is all the conversation that happened related to epidemics, right? And I won't go into this. Um, Sheikh Umar Suleiman uh, has a lecture on this. Dr. Yasser Qadi has a lecture on this. Uh, you can hear all of these lectures on YouTube. You can easily find them. Um, I did a few sessions on this, uh, but I would you know, prefer that you refer to those done by the scholars because this has to do with um, many narrations of the uh, prophet and things of that sort. So it's a bit of a sensitive subject, but the key idea is that there is so much guidance, um, first of all, in the prophetic tradition on how we navigate when there's an epidemic of some sort. Um, and then all of the uh, expansion of the prophetic tradition into the general Islamic medical knowledge tradition. Um, and there's so much more there that to be found uh, that has to do with epidemics to the point that people were falsely attributing to Ibn Sina the concept of quarantine based on a movie that was released in the Soviet Union like a few decades ago in which some actor just happened to say as part of his line that Ibn Sina was you know working on epidemics and stuff like that and one thing led to another and we had articles going viral in the Muslim community especially about how Ibn Sina had come up with the concept of the 40-day quarantine which is not the case Right? So we have to be mindful of, of not exaggerating and not um, making things out to be what they weren't as well. Um, and I, I always love starting with this example because I think it really kind of, in a nutshell, uh, gives us a sense of the spirit of uh, contribution, the spirit of uh, curiosity, the spirit of not giving up on any topic um, that was persistent and that was uh, you know, actively encouraged socially um, in the early Muslim uh, empires. Um, and so, uh, the, the, and, and because it's such a light subject, the question is, why do we laugh, right? And this is something that a lot of people in the Islamic world, a lot of researchers were trying to figure out. So Aristotle had defined, who is of course from before, long before the Islamic tradition, but he had defined the human as the laughing animal and said, well, no other animal laughs. Right? So one, other dis one distinctive feature of the human is that human beings can laugh, um, or, or at least that was his understanding of it. I'm not sure if animals can laugh or not, don't quote me on it. Um, but uh, you had people following that Greek tradition and trying to expand on it and trying to explore this concept. Um, and, and out of all the people you see on this page, I've, I've listed, well, apart from Aristotle, I've listed four others. All of them seem to have Muslim names, but only one of them was actually Muslim. And that is uh, Abu Yusuf al-Kindi, right? So Ali ibn Rabban uh, al-Tabari is a Jew. He's a Jewish uh, medical researcher from the early Muslim empire. And he suggests that the reason we laugh is because the result of the boiling of the natural blood when a human being sees or hears something that diverts him and thus startles and moves him, right? So it's, it's something related to the blood. Like that's what he can figure out, that it has to do with the blood. Um, Abu Yusuf al-Kindi, who is the Muslim on this list, he says it's the result of the even-tempered purity of the blood of the heart. So we're getting a bit more specific. And by the way, all of these, all of them are from like the 8th and 9th century, so more than a thousand years ago. Um, Ishaq ibn Imran, he wrote a treatise called On Melancholy, and uh, uh, he says that laughter occurs through purification of the blood, uh, and he speculates that three organs may be involved in this process not just the heart, but also the spleen and the liver. And so when the blood has been purified and at the right moment, there's an external stimuli of some sort, um, that's when uh, laughter is produced in the human being. Um, and then Ishaq ibn Suleiman, I didn't put all the details, who was a student of the, the previous person, um, but he basically said that laughter is a sign of healthy blood circulation through, um, uh, throughout the body and especially to the mind and he goes into all kinds of interesting details and and these uh, weren't just like footnotes or something like that like these were actually works that they wrote about laughter that made their way into Europe 
and that were further expanded upon by European thinkers uh, and scientists trying to explore the same question. So the idea here that a few ideas that I wanna get across is first you see that they're um, drawing upon the Greek tradition, which I mentioned earlier. Secondly, you see why I, I mentioned the Islamicate uh, aspect, because out of all of the researchers um, who are listed on this page, only one of them is Muslim, but all of them are benefiting from the culture created by the Muslims and all of it are benefiting the culture of the Muslims, right? So you see what I'm saying here that many people of many different backgrounds were involved in this sort of single-minded endeavor to produce uh, and explore as much knowledge as possible. And it wasn't just something exclusive to Muslims, but it was something that had ultimately been inspired by the Islamic tradition. Um, and of course today, I don't know uh, if you guys are familiar, I just learned this today that there's a field of the study of laughter known as gelotology, I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced. Um, but, but it's interesting how it's how laughter therapy is a thing, how um, you know, the laughter is explored so scientifically and, and there's actually a scientific explanation for it, which I had never thought about and which I was kind of really um, fascinated to learn about, right? But it gives you an idea of no, like stone was left unturned. No subject was like, oh, like who cares about that? Let's worry about uh, cancer. And they wrote a lot about cancer, right? As much as they possibly probably could at the time about cancer, but they did not neglect any subject. And so, you know, even in when we talk about the big achievements, right? Like we'll talk about later on in this presentation, keep in mind like these, um, what we perceive to be the smaller contributions as well that happened along the way, but that built up to give us all of the knowledge that we have today. There were many, many small contributions, things that you find even today in textbooks of, of medical history, you'll find them in a footnote or in an end note or just like an afterthought or something like that, but they have produced um, the knowledge that we have today. And just to give you a sense of, of how diverse this is, right? Like they're, they're just thinking about everything. So homesickness was written about as a marad, as a disease. So homesickness was discussed. Uh, prisoners' rights to medical treatment. So uh, we have records from the time of the fourth Rashidun uh, Khalifa, Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, about his concern that prisoners' rights to medical treatment was respected. Uh, of uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, one of the famous Umayyad uh, Khulafa, right? One of the famous uh, Umayyad leaders of the Umayyad dynasty. Um, he uh, you know, there's records of him making sure that prisoners' right to medical treatment were respected. And, and many um, physicians are writing about why this is so important uh, for social well-being as well as for the individual well-being of the prisoner and how just like every person in society um, and even animals within society have a right to medical treatment, uh, so do prisoners. Um, there's, there's books, uh, there's literally a book uh, that one of them wrote called Even the Best Physicians Don't Know Everything, or, or basically that was the gist of the title, right? And it's a book on essentially reminding physicians to remain humble and to remain hungry, right? That's the same thing we remind ourselves today uh, in any field of research, like stay humble and stay hungry and keep seeking answers uh, for all the questions that still remain. Um, the famous sayings and discussions about like this famous saying, don't make your stomach the graveyard of animals, right? Some indications that there were some uh, Muslims who explored uh, vegetarianism, right? Uh, either for uh, as part of a treatment for an illness or uh, perhaps even as part of a choice, right? And this famous saying that don't eat so much meat that you make your stomach the graveyard of animals. And this was extensively discussed between um, physicians throughout the centuries. Um, topics such as why the price of sugar skyrocketed during epidemics in Egypt specifically. Um, and, and again, fascinating stories related to this about why exactly this happened, but sugar for a long time was uh, presumed to have a lot of medical benefits, right? So sugar was actually sold in pharmacies. And whenever there was an epidemic, people were encouraged to sort of consume sugar in different ways. And so the, the demand would go up um, and, and the supply would be low, which means the prices would skyrocket. Um, and, and so we have those kind of interesting um, incidents. Uh, we have discussions of the health benefits of excellent musk from Tibet and Kashmir specifically. The musk that comes from Tibet 
uh, or Kashmir and the health benefits of having that uh, aromatic uh, sort of environment of if you're about to do specific activities, then you should uh, use must before that. Um, Ibn Sina's poetry on why other physicians were jealous of him. And he was shocked and he was surprised on why would anyone be jealous of me? And um, it, it, funny story, I may go into the details later on if we have time. Um, eggplants allegedly causing freckles and cancer, big issue in early Muslim society where many doctors alleged um, and particularly because eggplants had this distinctively sour taste, they uh, kind of um, had this, I guess, presumption or they made this association that eggplants cause things like freckles and certain forms of cancer until a ninth century uh, princess uh, or queen in Baghdad, whose name was Buran, found a new way to cook eggplants after a lot of experimentation in the kitchen and literally single-handedly changed this history of the eggplant. So that's another story for another time. Uh, music therapy to treat mental illness. So you see the, the, which was used in the Ottoman Empire and a lot of Ottoman hospitals. So you see like generally the picture I'm trying to paint is that um, medicine was uh, just one aspect of healthy living and healthy living tied into uh, all aspects of life and, and all aspects of society in so many different ways, right? And um, this is something that I think with the specialization um, of our time in every field, that this is something that perhaps has been lessened, this uh, kind of thought about the interactions that our individual areas of specialization have with society as a whole, especially the cultural interactions, like what is the cultural aspects of society that a doctor today needs to be aware of. I think these are some really interesting questions to explore. Um, and and you, maybe you find some inspiration in this list over here. Another question I wanna uh, look into before I go into specific details um, of, of specific physicians is the question that we always have to ask uh, in history, sadly enough, is where are all the women? Um, and because, uh, you know, it's, it's, history has been recorded not as a reflection of society, but as really as a reflection of what the historians taught were the most important aspects of society. And the historians themselves were often male and the people that they were writing about uh, who were people of influence because of the structure of society were often male. And so you get a very male-centric history of the human uh, experience, um, literally and really in every society um, with very, very few exceptions, right? And so the history of Islamic medicine is, is no exception to this. And by the way, this wasn't always a um, deliberate or, or conscious choice. I don't want to make it, uh, make it out to seem like every historian or, um, uh, or, or even the field as a whole, like people need to be personally held responsible for this or something like that. Like that's a discussion for historians themselves to have among themselves and to try to navigate this. Like, you know, and these questions are still being explored of why this is the case. Uh, but I put it here just for the purpose of making sure I specifically mention um, whatever I was able to find on Muslim women's contributions uh, specifically to the development of the Islamic medical tradition. Uh, so we have people like a person named Zainab, whose full name we don't know. Uh, she flourished sometime prior to 1270 in Al-Andalus in Spain. Uh, she was a physician, so a tabiba and a ophthalmologist um, of the Banu Aud of the Umayyad period. So the Umayyad dynasty in Al-Andalus in Muslim Spain, there was a tribe uh, that existed there, an Arab tribe at the time called the Banu Aud, and she was from them. Um, and she was their physician uh, of the tribe. Um, we also know from her time about women who were professional uh, bloodletters, right? So bloodletting or hajama is, um, uh, or, or what's called cupping, uh, is uh, something that was a standard medical technique sort of uh, seen as a detox um, for, for much of Islamic history and even today, uh, going back all the way to the prophetic tradition. Um, and there were professional blood letters, uh, many of whom were women as well uh, in Al-Andalus. Um, the, the next two people in the list we have here are from a very famous uh, family of doctors named the Banu Zuhur. And we'll talk about a person named Ibn Zuhur shortly. Um, who is one of the most famous uh, Muslim physicians of all time. 
And uh, Rufaida al Aslamiya is actually his sister, so Ibn Zuhair's sister. Um, and what I find really fascinating is that she is known to have been a physician uh, from the city of Seville in, in Spain. And what's fascinating is that um, her father, who we also know was a physician, and I'll mention the details later on, but she is named after a Sahabiya, a female companion of Prophet Muhammad, um, who was also uh, famous for her expertise as a nurse. So Rufaida al-Islamiyya is the name of a female companion. If you go to Medina and um, you go to what's called the seven mosques and you do ziyara, you visit those seven mosques in the city of Medina. Um, and if you go to the mosque of the companion Salman al-Farisi, Salman the Persian, um, that mosque was used as a makeshift sort of hospital uh, led by Rufaida al aslamiyya as a nurse uh, during the Battle of the Trench, during the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and the Prophet actually gave her the same uh, share of spoils that he gave to the soldiers who actually fought in the battle uh, for her contribution as a nurse and, uh, you know, her effort to lead this, um, to, to, to lead this uh, healing effort. Um, and so what's fascinating to me is that this doctor of Banu Zuhar named his daughter Rufaida al aslamiya perhaps uh, hoping when she was very young that she would one day become a physician, and she did. And then uh, her brother was also a, a famous physician, Ibn Zuhar. And then uh, her daughter, Umm al Hassan was another famous uh, physician, all from the city of Seville, all from the family of Banu Zuhar. Um, we have another record of an unnamed, sadly, uh, chief physician of the Mansuri Hospital in Cairo. Uh, who took the role uh, after the death of her father in around 1626. Uh, so she's a chief physician of the hospital for some time. Uh, Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the most famous uh, jurists um, in Islamic history, um, somebody who comes up with um, Islamic legal rulings uh, on issues that are unclear. Uh, he took the expert opinion of a Muslim midwife on the impact of Ramadan fasting on a fetus before issuing a ruling. So many things to unpack there. First of all, he's consulting an expert, not just issuing a ruling, which is something that he is required to do. Um, and secondly, that there is a very interesting tradition of Muslim uh, midwifery um, in many parts, uh, virtually all parts of the Muslim lands. Um, and <coughs> sorry, in, you know, in Egypt, Egypt of uh, people like um, uh, they had family names like son of the midwife right like this was a family name passed down from generation to generation so there were entire clans known as sons of the midwife right some a famous midwife and um, both among the Jews of Egypt as well as among the Muslims um, and Ibn Khaldun made high praise for midwives as well due to their important role in society uh, and there's an entire book, which is an excellent book on, uh, you know, the role and contribution of Muslim midwives um, in Islamic history uh, that I can share with you later on. Um, and finally, there are illustrations of female surgeons performing surgery on other women in the works uh, of Sharaf al-Din uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, of Amesa. And what's interesting is uh, about, you know, several things here is that first of all, the date 1470, very early on, like this is shortly after the Ottomans conquered uh, Constantinople. So this is early on in Ottoman history. Uh, at the same time, it's well after the period of what we know as, or what people consider the decline to have set in. So there's still progress being made in different areas, uh, despite the narrative that a firm decline had set in. Um, and then the second thing to note is the city of Amesa, which is in Turkey, in inner Anatolia, then part of the Ottoman Empire. And so this wasn't one of the bigger cities of the empire. This wasn't the capital. It wasn't Constantinople, uh, where you might find uh, generally in the capitals in the bigger cities, you might find um, more uh, of a uh, diversity, more of a progressive attitude, I guess we could say, um, in, in certain aspects of society, but you're in the city of Amesa, which is a relatively modest city, you're finding female surgeons at work. Um, and so uh, that gives you an indication that this may have been a common practice in other places as well. So some indications of the, the specific role played by uh, Muslim women. And of course, 
uh, absence of evidence uh, is, is not evidence of absence, right? Um, there's a lot of um, manuscripts that are waiting to be like unpacked and explored, and maybe we'll find a lot more detail someday, inshallah, on this topic. Um, I want to talk about uh, Muhammad ibn Zakaria al-Razi, going into like, the specifics of the people who contributed. Um, al-Razi is, is one of the most uh, famous of the Islamic it, um, physicians, and he began studying medicine relatively late. At the age of 30 is when he first uh, began studying medicine. He worked in many different fields before that and also concurrently. Um, and he did much of his work in Ghay, in, in close to what is now Tehran in Iran and in Baghdad, and was the director of many hospitals, as well as the royal physician of the Abbasid dynasty and uh, the director of the main hospital in Baghdad. Um, he's, considering, uh, he's considered a pioneering figure in uh, immunology, um, the first to distinguish smallpox from measles. And, and this was such a uh, contribution, right? Um, and I remember reading about this uh, specifically that um, in Europe later on in the 13th century and the 14th century when um, this treatise that he had written distinguishing smallpox from measles, when it was first discovered, um, over the next 400 years or so, more than 40 editions of it were published. So imagine you write a book and you pass away and 400 years after you pass away, somebody picks it up somewhere. And it's still the most up-to-date book on that topic to the point that it has to be reprinted in different editions 40 times throughout Europe. And the most recent, the last of those editions was published in 1866, which is so recent. It's actually amazing that even as recently as 1866, um, Ar uh, you know, uh, treatise on smallpox and measles was still considered an authoritative text on the subject and no significant advancement had been made uh, really. And uh, he was also the first to discuss allergies in detail. And um, he wrote a book called Diseases of Children and he is considered the father of pedi pediatrics. Uh, I'm so sorry if I'm butchering any medical terminology, which I know for a fact that I probably am, um, but bear with me, this is not my field. I'm not even a historian of medicine. I'm just trying to distill and uh, repackage this content for you. And hopefully you guys understand it much better than I ever will, because I'm assuming many of you are in this field. Um, when he died, uh, his students compiled a 20 volume Kitab al Havi fil Tib, uh, the comprehensive book of medicine, uh, which became a standard encyclopedia addressing virtually every known medical problem. Um, the only problem with the encyclopedia was that it was too big to constantly produce copies of. It was just way too big. And probably the only reason Ibn Sina's work became more popular than the work of Arvazi was because Ibn, Ibn Sina's work was more concise and a bit more accessible and wasn't as exhaustive. It wasn't as huge as uh, the Comprehensive Book of Medicine was uh, by uh, Arvazi. Uh, to give a specific example of something that he pioneered in is um, his treatise called uh, Fi Awja al Mafasil. Um, on joint pains and is considered a pioneering work in arthrology and contains one of the earliest descriptions of capillaries, right? So again, you, you find in all of these many different treaties and works that they're writing, um, you know, it's not like he had the most extensive understanding of capillaries, but it's, it's just something he, he mentioned, just something he noticed and he wrote it down. And they would write down anything. And, and there's some very funny incidents about the kinds of things that they would write down in the margins of the manuscripts as they were writing, which have still survived to this day. Um, but I want to come back to the final question. So look up this name and read more about his contribution. Was he Muslim or just Islamic? Right. And I, you know, I think it's important to, to ask ourselves this question. His name obviously seems to suggest that he was Muslim and that he was of at least of Muslim background. Um, which he, he must have been. Now, at the same time, he worked in many other fields and he wrote many texts that, um, you know, contained certain things that he said and certain positions that he held, uh, which would, you know, not even controversially, which would clearly kind of, uh, he was really toying the line or he was crossing the line completely uh, in terms of what is acceptable uh, for a Muslim to say. And these weren't just you know, random topics. I'm talking about things he was saying uh, about Prophet Muhammad, things he was saying about the Quran, etc. Right? Um, now, 
do I know that that was his final say? Maybe he wrote another work uh, that we're not aware of where he uh, changed his views. Maybe he uh, just repented um, and, and came back uh, from those, um, uh, from those uh, sort of inappropriate views later on in his life. Like there's a lot we don't know, right? And we generally assume the best, but I really just wanted to bring this up for us to keep in mind that um, we have to be a bit more careful and try to read a bit deeper when we claim people as uh, Muslims, which is why it's so much easier and so much more um, beneficial in a sense to use the word Islamic, because Muslim is uh, almost a, you know, a technical term as well as an identity, right? But uh, there were some people who we presumed to be Muslim scientists, and Muslim thinkers that, that cared, they didn't care much for either the technicality or the identity but they were still operating within the Islamic culture. They were still contributing to the Islamic culture. That was still their background. And so we still discuss them in our general discussion about Muslim contributions to medicine. Um, you may have already recognized Ibn Sina from this, uh, like his picture is kind of, of course, we don't have no idea how he looked like, um, but he's kind of, um, uh, this is a popular picture that circulates or from his name here, Ibn Sina. Uh, the Kitab Al-Qanun fil Tib, which is where the word canon, as in uh, a body of work, a body of literature, that canon, uh, that's where it comes from as well. Um, so the canon of medicine, literally one of the most famous medical um, works of all time of human history, right? And in fact, um, even uh, as recently as, as, you know, very close to our time, uh, William Osler, who was, uh, who you may be familiar with, I believe there's a hospital named after him. Uh, here in Toronto or, or somewhere uh, in Ontario. Um, and uh, he was a physician who was Canadian. Um, and he famously like used to say, and again, this is fairly recent. Uh, he used to say that uh, Ibn Sina's Qanun Fil Tib was a medical Bible in Europe uh, for, for centuries, like the longest standing medical Bible, uh, the, the most, uh, the longevity of this work, the point that even like I mentioned about the treaties on smallpox and measles, which were the treaties, but for an entire uh, compendium of knowledge, the Kitab al-Qanun, um, to survive and to be uh, taught and to be read unchallenged for centuries and centuries uh, in Europe and also to influence Chinese medicine, as we'll discuss later on, uh, is an incredible achievement. Um, and here we have a, a poem, which uh, I just thought I'd put a, you know, just to make it even, <laughs> uh, a poem by Ibn Sina, which he wrote about medicine, and he wrote many medical poems. So he combined his interests in art and poetry. And he's a very fascinating person. I really encourage you to look into his life. Like, I think if you can, you can make a proper Netflix series or a movie or something just on his life story, apart from his achievements and his contributions. Like he's, you know, spending time in prisons um, and he has a fascinating kind of love life and um, he's moving between empires and, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs and a lot of interesting events that he's involved in. Um, one interesting thing to note about him is that he was, um, for him in his worldview, being a physician was a stepping stone towards being a philosopher. So the ultimate knowledge for him was knowledge of uh, philosophy, apart from the Islamic disciplines, but the ultimate knowledge was the knowledge of philosophy. And for him, being a physician was a way to get there, uh, which is sort of interesting how culturally um, that has uh, been a very different um, situation, very different hierarchy in our own times. Um, and so this is a poem, as I was mentioning, that he wrote on how to stay healthy in all four different seasons. And he wrote it in the form of poetry and just general medical advice. He was a huge believer in uh, preventative medicine, right? Um, now, I want to discuss um, diabetes specifically. Uh, Dianitas, uh, or that's what Ibn Sina called it, but the only, it should be diabetas, right? Which is a word that was known from ancient Greek. Uh, but what happened is, um, if you're familiar with the Arabic language and the Arabic script, it seems that somewhere in the process of transliteration, what somebody did was um, the, the dot of the ba, which makes the b sound, they took it from the diacritic dot, they took it from uh, below the letter and they put it on top, so it became the noon, which makes the n sound, 
So it, instead of diabetes, Ibn Sina ends up calling it uh, Dianitas. Um, now I wanna go into this. I'm just looking at the time here. I don't think I have too much time. Uh, this one specifically, I wanted to use as a case study. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the rest of the presentation and then maybe come back to this if there's somehow that we can make more time to discuss this. And the reason I like discussing uh, diabetes as an example is because I'm a type one diabetic myself uh, for almost 18 years now. So I think it's one of the few medical disorders or conditions that I can actually uh, discuss in detail because I actually understand the ins and outs of the science. Um, and so we'll see if we can come back to this, but I have, I wanna go through an article um, I had posted on my blog uh, related to this. And in case we don't get a chance to come back, I think I should just open it and, and show it to you guys anyways. So this is my blog, iHistory. Um, I wrote an article, I, I wrote this just about two weeks ago about the early history of diabetes in the Islamic world. Um, and, and I was surprised, especially as a diabetic patient on uh, just the effort, just the spirit of trying to figure out how to solve this problem, how to solve this uh, condition, uh, to find effective treatments for it, to find some kind of cure for it, as well as some stories about people who likely suffered uh, from diabetes. And of course, there was uh, no treatment for it at the time, uh, certainly no cure. So the Abbasid ruler al Batik is one of them. Um, and he burned to death in an oven, uh, trying to heat himself up, which he thought might help him relieve himself from the symptoms of this condition. Um, and another uh, person is uh, Ibn Zuhar, right? So Ibn Zuhar, who I mentioned earlier, um, as uh, the brother uh, or uh, as the brother of Rufayda al-Aslamiyya, one of the famous Islamic uh, physicians, um, he is someone who is speculated to have suffered from diabetes as well, uh, as well as his father. So the father of uh, uh, Rufayda al-Aslamiyya as well, that they both suffered from diabetes uh, and complications, and uh, that is what led to their death. Um, and so we'll come back to this uh, if there's more time for this. Um, moving on to al-Zahrawi. Um, you can see this beautiful illustration of his uh, surgical instruments and, and him sort of performing a surgery. So this is all kind of pictures that uh, illustrate what I'm about to say. Um, Abu al-Qasim al-Zahrawi, he flourished in Medina al-Zahra, uh, which was the royal palace uh, in the city of uh, Cordoba, uh, which is where he gets the name al-Zahrawi. He's considered the greatest surgeon of Islam and of the Middle Ages. Um, he invented more than 100 surgical instruments, many of which are still in use today. Um, and the syringe, uh, I love the description of the syringe. Like when I read it, you know, a syringe is, again, as a diabetic patient, um, who has been using syringes and insulin pens and stuff like that. And of course, we all at some point have had to take some kind of shot. Um, a syringe seems like, yeah, like this is, this is kind of like a very simple concept. Like, of course, right? Like, of course, this is how it would work. But the way he describes a syringe, it's so uh, surreal almost to know that the person living a thousand years ago, uh, a Muslim, invented the syringe, invented the entire concept of it, and the way he's describing it and trying to sell it to the reader as this is something that actually works is fascinating. Another, uh, for example, another instrument is um, the forceps that are used uh, during childbirth. Um, he pioneered the use of uh, inhalant um, anesthesia. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you could go into like so many different examples, which I won't go into because I'm trying to basically expose you to names and then move on to the next one. Um, and the translations of his Kitab al-Tasrif, again, were one of the standard medical texts used in Europe until the 17th century, until the 1600s. So really until the end of the Renaissance and uh, the period of the beginning of the Enlightenment, uh, it was the Muslims, um, the translated texts and the edited versions of the texts written by the Muslim physicians that were sort of standard sources of medical knowledge uh, in most of Europe. Um, the next person is Ibn al-Nafis, uh, born in Damascus, but lived much of his life in Cairo. Um, he's the first to describe the pulmonary and coronary circulation of the blood, but incompletely. So it wasn't a complete description. Um, the credit for that, although even, uh, it, I mean, the credit for that goes to William Harvey, but even he had an incomplete description, right? But these were the building blocks. Um, the first to bring up the concept of pulmonary circulation at all, really, even if it was incomplete, was Ibn al-Nafis. 
uh, in the 13th century. Um, he was one of the few thinkers of his time to hold that it was the brain and not the heart that was responsible for thinking and sensation, right? So again, a lot of things that we take for granted today or that seem to make a lot of sense uh, were things that uh, required a lot of um, careful observation, a lot of speculation, years of study and research uh, to just discover or even to propose some kind of um, idea that, hey, maybe it's not the heart, maybe it's the brain where the thinking happens, um, that sort of thing. Um, and he compiled, again, one of the largest medical encyclopedias ever written, um, which was largely a uh, commentary on the work of Ibn Sina, uh, as well in the Qanun Faltib, in the canon of medicine. Um, and of course, the canon of medicine, like I mentioned before, remained the standard go-to uh, medical text, uh, essentially summarizing all available medical knowledge um, and uh, emphasizing preventative medicine, general healthy living, um, and, and having a very holistic approach to healthcare, which I hope we can come back to if we can go to the example of uh, diabetes. Um, a few honorable mentions. Um, and again, like I mentioned at the beginning, there were so many people making what we might call like small contributions, right? Smaller contributions, not as profound, not as huge, not huge books, but still contributing to, uh, you know, uh, moving the conversation forward throughout history and, and leaving these building blocks uh, for people who came later to build upon um, coming all the way to the knowledge that we have today. So you'll see again, uh, a lot of non-Muslim names, especially early on. So you have uh, Yohanna ibn Masaway, you have, uh, who is Jewish, you have uh, Hunayn ibn Ishaq, uh, who is Christian. Um, and they are uh, two of the leading early translators and compilers of medical knowledge uh, in the city of Baghdad. And they, um, you know, uh, through their knowledge of different languages and through their contacts with uh, Gundi Shiapur, which I mentioned earlier, they brought uh, much of the knowledge uh, from there into um, the Beit al-Hikmah, uh, the general culture of learning in Baghdad, in Cairo, in Damascus, in other places. Uh, and then that's uh, the knowledge was translated into Arabic and into Persian, and that's how it became to um, be built upon. Uh, Sinan ibn Thabit, very interesting person. We don't have too many details about his life, uh, but we do know that at the instruction of one of the Abbasid rulers, Al-Muqtadir, uh, he initiated a certification program for physicians um, before, it should say, before they can practice, uh, including a modified and Islamified version of the Hippocratic Oath. Right. Um, Abu Rayhan al-Biruni, who is probably um, out of all Muslim scientists and thinkers, I would say he's my favorite. Definitely, please look up this name to see his achievements in other fields. I just wanted to point out that um, after everything he achieved in other fields, like, for example, calculating, nearly accurately calculating the circumference of the earth a thousand years ago, after everything he achieved, in his mid-70s, he you know, sat down to write a book called Kitab al-Saydana fil Tib, in which he listed 890 uh, materia medica, um, and the book title translates to a book of pharmacy in medicine. Um, and the reason he wanted to do this, even though there were other similar books available, is because he is also considered the father of Indology, the study of Indian civilization. And he had learned Sanskrit himself, and he had spent time in what is now Pakistan, um, and he was, of course, of Persian background, but uh, basically he wanted to make sure that whatever um, uh, knowledge was available in the Sanskrit language that had not been transferred uh, into one of the languages of the Muslims um, would also uh, make that transition. So even in his mid-70s, and he passed away just a few uh, years after this, and, and historians of medicine, are, I think, are, are a bit spoiled because I was, I was reading about this, and um, the, the historian who wrote about it was saying, um, you know, it's it basically it sucks that he passed away only a few years after because he never got to revise the book, right? And he's in his mid seventies when he's writing it, right? So you want him to revise it as well, um, and it wasn't even his field. But again, that desire to contribute, that desire to learn and to produce knowledge. Uh, Abu Bakr ibn Tufail, uh, known for writing the first novel uh, ever, arguably, in the history of literature called Hay ibn Yaqzan. Um, he, he was a physician and a philosopher, and he combined both his 
um, his knowledge of medicine and as well as his knowledge of philosophy and his ideas of philosophy into this work. Uh, so it's often considered the first work of science fiction as well. Um, and he was an early proponent of dissection and autopsy uh, in the novel. So dissection and autopsy are part of the novel itself. And then finally, whose uh, death date that we're about to write down, uh, Musa ibn Hamoun, who was a Spanish Jewish physician uh, who was basically during the Reconquista, he had to leave Spain uh, and then went to many different places. He went to London, he went to Antwerp, uh, he spent some time in Italy, and finally he settled in Istanbul, where he received sponsorship from the Ottoman Sultan. Um, and actually in the Fateh complex, which you can still visit today, uh, which is um, the Sultan Fateh Mosque, um, but uh, you know every mosque had sort of a, a larger complex attached to it with like a soup kitchen and like a, uh, uh, I guess a walk-in clinic of sorts and this sort of thing. So that's where he worked and he wrote the first known work uh, specifically dedicated to dentistry. Um, and now moving to like other examples, um, which, you know, we often think about this transition from um, the Arab, uh, Persian, Muslim culture to like Europe without thinking about the Muslim influence in other parts of the world uh, in different fields of knowledge. So this is a good example. So Hu Sihui uh, was a royal dietitian at the Yuan uh, dynasty's court in Beijing, what was actually called Fan Balik at the time. And uh, he published uh, the Jinsheng uh, Zheng Yao, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, which is uh, essentially translates to essential things for the emperor's food and drink. So he's a royal dietitian, and the book he writes, which is published in around the year 1330 uh, in Beijing and publishes there, um, is a sort of a compendium of uh, recipes, of uh, lists of ingredients that have certain health benefits, um, as well as about things such as eating habits um, and general healthy living as it relates to food. It's very fascinating and there's a lot of signs that he was likely a Muslim and likely of Central Asian background. Perhaps he was a Uyghur Muslim or um, a Kazakh or Uzbek uh, Muslim, even a Mongolian Muslim, something like that, but working in the Chinese uh, cultural sphere. This is actually an illustration of him giving advice, uh, nutritional advice to other people. Um, but he published that book and there's very interesting uh, kind of recipes in there. My favorite example is that there's no word for chickpeas in the Chinese language at the time. So he literally just calls them Muslim beans as like these beans that the Muslims like to eat. So that's how he describes chickpeas. Um, and then sometime later, some decades later, there was another uh, work published called uh, Hui Hui Yao Feng, uh, which translates to Islamic prescriptions um, in which uh, was listed 517 Islamic names for materia medica. And you can actually see an edition of that in the picture at the bottom right here. You can see if you look closely, um, there's the Chinese name for a particular uh, ingredient uh, or a particular item. And then there's, uh, in many cases, a Persian or Arabic or Turkic name written in the Arabic script right beside it. Um, and this list was based on Ibn Sina's Qanun fil Tib, right? The canon of medicine again. And it was compiled by a Christian whose name was Isa Tarjunan, uh, again, somebody who's probably from the Persianate kind of world, uh, who along with his wife, Sara, also established an Islamic hospital in Beijing. And again, this is all in the late 1300s and early 1400s. Um, and finally, we, there's a 13th century shipwreck, which is known as the Jawa Sea Wreck, uh, about a shipment of medical ingredients going from Southeast Asia from Java, from the island of, uh, which is now part of Indonesia, up to China, uh, which in includes uh, Islamic materia medica, such as resin, uh, which was used for producing ointments and, and many other sort of medical purposes. So again, just to give you a sense that there were uh, exchanges of knowledge happening uh, in many different places. Um, Anna Musa is, uh, again, in West Africa as well. There was a strong tradition, not only of uh, West African Islamic uh, folk medicine um, and, and even some occult uh, kind of practices, but also of, um, uh, you know, medical uh, knowledge, like what we might call like allopathic uh, medical knowledge was being produced as well. And this is one of the manuscripts that was um, on display a few years ago at the Library of Congress in the United States, 
uh, of a, uh, and you can see there's a chart here identifying medical uh, ingredients and, and their combinations and what kind of illnesses that they can be used to treat, uh, et cetera. And then during the enslavement period, during the transatlantic slave trade, um, Muslim enslaved were known for being particularly educated and they were known for, and sometimes just rumored for, even though it wasn't true, having a lot of like, you know, quote unquote, healing power. Like there was this mystique around them that they had all kinds of knowledge. And much of that probably has to do with the fact that they had access to resources like this manuscript and many other manuscripts, by the way, like this is just literally scratching the surface. There are more than a million manuscripts from the West African Islamic world on all different subjects, not just medicine that have to be explored and we don't know what we'll find in terms of medical knowledge in Islamic in West Africa. But just to give you an example of how the knowledge was transferred as well, Benjamin Cochrane, somebody who lived in Jamaica in Kingston in the early 1800s, he was a free black. We don't know exactly how he uh, became uh, free. Uh, of course, uh, either, um, uh, you know, I mean, there's many different ways that there could be free blacks despite the period of enslavement uh, in Jamaica as well. And, and I won't go into the details, um, but that's basically what he was. And he was, uh, first of all, secretly Muslim. Um, and the reason we know that is because uh, a famous, there were some indications that they were secretly Muslim, him and a group of other uh, blacks living in Kingston, Jamaica at the time. And one of the British officials, what he did was uh, he gathered them in a room and then he sat down and he started to uh, recite things, uh, you know, he had some knowledge of Arabic, he started to read things about, um, uh, you know, Prophet Muhammad, and then uh, he, he notes, he actually writes his observations that when he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, you know, peace be upon him, when he said that, he said, these people who were around me, who were telling us for years that they were Christian, were basically essentially like jumping up and down with happiness and excitement. Uh, they thought that this British official had basically converted to Islam, but he was just testing them. But basically, they inadvertently revealed that they maintained their Muslim faith in secret. Um, but uh, to our point, he was an amateur physician. So he would do like um, a lot of like, you know, whatever knowledge of medicine that he had uh, or he had been able to gain, despite the difficult circumstances. And that's the point I'm trying to point out uh, in this specific uh, case, that despite the extremely difficult circumstances, uh, of enslavement, uh, the, really the horrors, there's no other word for it, of that experience if you really read about it in detail. Um, still, he finds the capacity and he finds the inspiration to try to be a physician and even really strive to get into the medical school in Jamaica at the time in the early 1800s, uh, which of course he's not allowed to enter because he is Black. Uh, and I forgot to mention his actual name was Anna Musa, and uh, Benjamin Cochrane was a name that he had been sort of forced to take on through the process of enslavement. And in many parts, especially of Latin America and South America, um, there's these interesting, very interesting surviving traditions of uh, traditional West African Islamic medicine uh, that have survived. I mean, the association with Islam is gone. The association even with West Africa is gone, uh, but there's certain elements that you see that uh, remind you that that is the legacy, that is uh, where they came from. Uh, just two more slides here, I wanna wrap up uh, very soon, inshallah. Um, the first, uh, I wanna share something about the Begums of uh, Bhopal. Um, and the Begums uh, are a series of rulers, you see one of them pictured here with her um, assistants, I guess. And Bhopal is a city in central India, like, like right in the middle of India, you'll find a city which was at the time a princely state um, ruling uh, sort of uh, with the cooperation of the British who were ruling India as a whole, uh, but the semi-independent princely state of Bhopal existed. And from 1819 to 1926, for over 100 years, uh, it was ruled by women with some uh, interruptions in between, but essentially it was uh, these four women who ruled the state, Hutsia, Sikandar, Shah Jahan, and Sultan Jahan, uh, and their, their last name, of course, was all Begums. Um, but just to give you a sense, again, I didn't mention India. Uh, I didn't mention much in Southeast Asia. I didn't mention much in South Asia. In many parts, I, I didn't go into detail. We don't have a lot of time, and uh, I don't have a lot of background, so this is more research for me to do. 
but I wanted to give this specific example of India that I did come across and found very fascinating. Um, so they started a, a hospital only staffed by female doctors and nurses. They established that in 1880. Um, Shah Jahan uh, Begum uh, wrote a personal health manual. Personally, she wrote it herself uh, for women on how to stay healthy, right? And these manuals in Urdu, they became a tradition that still survives in Northern India and in Pakistan today of these uh, sort of um, uh, manuals uh, for, for, that are specifically written for women, especially when there's a very limited access to education. So this is something like an alternative way to access like uh, education in a very easily digestible sort of way on different aspects of life. So she actually started that tradition in many ways um, and you know, was part of the first wave of those kind of manuals. Um, the Begums were also advocates of vaccination, fascinatingly enough, um, and they were attacked by British anti-waxers. <laughs> even more fascinating, right? So what's interesting here is bringing together different traditions of uh, medicine, right? So you remember I mentioned like uh, sort of the Yunani tradition coming from the Greeks and then continued by the Muslims, especially by Ibn Sina, which had uh, really not been significantly changed all the way into the 1800s, which we're talking about here and in the context of South Asia. So the people who practiced that were called Hakims, right? Um, and, and you'll still find like this reference if you're from South Asia, of, like we often refer to like the, the doctor as Hakim, um, but it's often referring to uh, a doctor that practices sort of Yunani medicine based on like uh, still based on like humorism and, um, you know, based on like observations of the pulse and observations of urine samples and those sort of things. Um, but the Begums uh, really put an effort into combining modern medicine with those uh, traditional uh, forms of medicine and uh, practicing them uh, together cohesively in a way that uh, put everything at the patient's disposal. So this fact I found very profound that in 1885, uh, in, this, in the princely state of Bhopal, the city state in central India that was ruled by uh, a woman, a Muslim woman, uh, nearly 14 and a half thousand vaccinations were performed by Hakims, right? And so the Hakim is someone you don't generally um, imagine buying into the idea of vaccination. And yet nearly 14 and a half thousand vaccinations were performed just by Hakims in the year 1885. So all these kind of interesting interplays and interchanges and, and contributions really, let's not forget, these are also contributions were happening, especially when they had like British anti-laxers uh, publicly coming after them saying like these people are idiots and all kinds of things. Why would you get a vaccination, right? Um, another example I wanted to mention is uh, Dr. Mukhtar Ansari, uh, who uh, was uh, somebody who practiced, he trained in India and then went on to practice medicine in the Charing Cross Hospital in London uh, in the UK where there's a ward named after him. Uh, and then he served the royal family in Bhopal, who sent him on a medical mission to the Ottoman Empire during World War I. So even though as part of British India, India was part of the British war effort, they snuck these medical professionals out of India, sent them to the Ottoman Empire, where they stayed for many months in the service of the person who was uh, believed to be the caliph, considered the caliph, the Ottoman uh, caliph was considered the, the leader of all the Muslims. So during the war, in his service, uh, this mission led by Dr. Mukhtar Ansari from India went uh, to support uh, the Ottoman war effort through their medical service. Um, and then other kinds of interesting ideas that the Begums of Bhopal tried to introduce. In 1909, a training facility and certification for women practitioners was initiated in Bhopal. And in 1923, the first baby show took place. And these baby shows were kind of a concept where uh, it's like a fashion show for, for babies, I guess, uh, where people bring their their baby uh, and uh, basically try to show off how healthy their baby is. And there were like professional doctors there from different traditions. And they would point out, and this was sort of like a woman's only thing. Um, and uh, they would point out like better ways to take care of babies and uh, protect them against malnutrition and disease and keep them uh, you know, give them uh, access to hygiene and all of these things. So there were many of these baby shows, the first of which happened in 1923 in Bhopal uh, as well. 
And then finally, uh, coming close to home in Canada, I saw in the slide we had at the very beginning of the program, um, we had um, uh, Dr. Aik Ahmed and uh, Dr. Ali Khan or Amina Khan, I apologize, I forget her name, um, and, uh, and many others uh, who continue to contribute in Canada specifically uh, to medical advancements, to the field of medicine. And again, even like your doctor who's, who's your, your local doctor who's not having like the biggest like, you know, uh, contribution, historic contribution to development in medicine, they are still contributing. This is a very, very important idea that I think through the examples that I have shared uh, is getting across that they are still contributing and people who aren't medical professionals can still contribute to the advancement of medicine in so many different ways. Um, and one of those people was Dr. Uh, Nayer Habib, uh, 1947 to present. Uh, he's still with us. He lives in uh, Abbotsford uh, in British Columbia. He was educated and trained in India and the United States and moved to Saskatoon in 1973 and then to uh, Regina in 1976. And when he was in Regina, uh, he was appointed by the University of Saskatchewan to establish the first cardiology program in Southern Saskatchewan. So he established it, uh, he initiated it, and he led the program from 1976 to 2001 uh, when he officially stepped down, um, but really uh, received very high praise for, for his contribution, not only in that, but also in his advocacy for physicians' rights as well as for patients' rights. Um, and uh, he continued to practice up until 2011 when he uh, you know, fully retired. And he has authored multiple books about his experiences, including his experience as a pioneer of the Muslim community in Saskatchewan, as one of the first Muslims to settle there, um, and as one of the first Muslims to initiate things such as the first mosque in Saskatchewan, and many other things. And um, there's other, you know, I wasn't able to find much else. I'm sure there are many other incredible stories to share uh, that are from the Canadian context specifically, uh, but I believe I'm already over time I'm going to keep looking for those stories. You should be looking for them as well. Um, ask the elders in your field, ask the people who came before you, ask them to actually share their stories. And you never know what kind of fascinating details you might find uh, about their experiences in Canada, in the fields that you are working in or that you're, you aspire to work in um, and it, their experiences in the early Muslim community and the development of the Muslim community in this land. Um, and so I'm going to wrap it up there. I hope you've taken away like a lot of food for thought, um, a lot of interesting information, a lot of uh, exposure to uh, new ideas that inspire you to read more uh, and to learn more. Um, there are a lot of resources. There are so many things that you can read, so many books on different aspects of medicine in Islamic history that I would be happy to recommend to you all uh, that I hope you all can um, read and benefit from as well. So thank you for listening. We'll see if we can come back and, and discuss diabetes a little bit. Uh, but if not, I hope this has still been beneficial. And uh, I'm looking forward to the q and Anyone still here? Yes. <laughs> Jazakumullah khair. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. I've, I've learned so much, so much. There's so much to actually like go through and go through so many Wikipedia, um, I don't know, like rabbit hole style. So thank you so much for providing all this um, very important knowledge. And um, I did actually want to um, segue ourselves into the question and answer period. Um, I know we mentioned a five minute break before, um, but as we are running a little bit short on time, um, we were thinking that question period, we can just get started with inshallah. So I'm just going to share the screen. All right, excellent. So we have, um, so far our guests in the audience, we have two ways to send questions. Um, we've been getting a couple questions through the Google form that we've linked here. It's also linked in the chat. Um, it's for those who are just listening in and don't have access to the screen, it's tinyurl.com slash capital H for history, um, capital Q lowercase s. And you can also just send your questions directly to myself or Brother Maz, who is also one of the co-hosts here. Um, so without further ado, I'm wondering whether um, this is an aspect, a couple of folks actually, whether Hassam, whether you would be um, willing to share a couple more of the resources that you were mentioning um, just at the end there about further readings that um, interested folks could access. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I think um, 
I should have found a way to do this already, to be honest. But uh, um, I'm thinking that if you have emails of all the registrants or something, maybe we can just uh, compare like a reading or compile a reading list and, and share it with all of them. Uh, if that could work, that would probably be the easiest way and I'll be happy to do that. But um, uh, I don't know if that works on your end or if there's a better way. Mm -hmm. No, that sounds excellent. So we will make sure to do that for our attendees. Um, so stay tuned, all of you folks who are listening at home. Um, we got a question um, that was, did you come across anything in your research specifically about Muslim contributions to the field of psychiatry or mental illness? Um, yes, I did. There, there's a lot um, on, on that field uh, specifically. Um, I didn't want to go into it because that's like another 10 presentations on its own. So there's a lot of things I, I said, you know, that I'm just not even going to do the scratch the surface stuff on this because it's irresistible and I'll be talking about this for like an hour. So um, I would definitely encourage you. Um, uh, so first of all, this is something that's being written about a lot more and being discussed about a lot more now, like historical Muslim contributions to the fields of mental health and well-being. Um, so that's something to be excited about. Like within the next few months, there's projects that I know of, and I know there's uh, several projects uh, that probably I'm not aware of that will also be coming out. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, my one of my colleagues at uh, Yakin Institute, uh, whose name is Dr. Rania Awad, um, if you can look uh, into her work, so her Instagram page, uh, if you find uh, Dr. Rania Awad on Instagram, she posts a lot of her ongoing work and um, whatever presentations and things of that sort that she's having there. So you can keep up with that. I know she is working on a book chapter uh, that will be published sometime next year on this topic, but recently she's done a lot of sessions like on this topic, uh, including one that was done with the Institute of Islamic Studies the uh, Institute of Islamic Institute of Toronto, the mosque uh, in, in uh, here in Toronto. So um, they did a long session, like a long conversation that's available on YouTube as well uh, on this specific topic. So there's a lot on it, um, a lot more that's uh, known and compiled from different sources, but um, there's no like book on it yet. Like there's no go-to resource. So I can't recommend anything like that. Um, but keep an eye out for that. I think pretty soon there will be, inshallah. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I have one final question um, that comes from our submission form, which is specifically about the field of academic um, history itself. Do you, do you think that there's a specific reason why we have less access to knowledge about um, Islamic contributions to medicine, um, is it systemic or is it uh, a lack of documentation? That's a good question. Um, I, I think it's a combination of many things. Uh, like I mentioned, I think one thing to appreciate is that generally uh, the history of Islamic medicine is something we have a lot more content to look at um, for as opposed to like many other aspects of the history of Islam, right? So that's, that's one thing to appreciate in general. Um, I think another thing is that there's a, there's a lack of awareness. Like I said, there's so many books, right? Um, uh, and, and some of them are, are so specific um, that, you know, there's, there's entire, so uh, the, the encyclopedia written by uh, Muhammad ibn Zakaria al-Razi, there's an entire, like a thick book that's just on the sources of his knowledge, right? So a lot of this stuff has been compiled, it has been edited, it has been published in the English language, but um, I think we, we often don't dig for it, right? And I do dig for it because I'm a historian and I like doing that sort of thing. Um, but, but this is why I hope these kind of sessions are helpful because now I hope you will all be digging for it as well. Like you have access to um, university libraries. I'm sure many of the people here, you have access to a lot of online resources and, and literally search up like, like anything, like Islam and dentists and history, like just run a search, right? And, and for anything, you'll find all kinds of fascinating resources. Uh, many of them are available online through university libraries and things of that sort. Um, that being said, generally a lot of uh, knowledge that was compiled in Islamic history still remains to be edited and translated into the English language. So there's a lot in like in Persian and Turkish and Urdu, 
uh, in Hausa, in West Africa, in, in many other parts, the regional languages and all the work that was compiled in those languages, um, it still uh, needs to be translated. So that's something that uh, we will need to continue to work on. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's a, uh, 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 an intentional kind of erasure of the contributions of Muslims uh, to medicine. I think it's just the fact that you don't know what you don't know. So even people who write uh, like Wikipedia pages or encyclopedia pages or uh, general textbooks of medicine and stuff like that, like if you didn't even know that there was something there, then yes, we can blame you for being a poor researcher, but we can't blame you specifically for, for you know, maybe going out of your way and trying to erase the Muslim contributions. I don't think there's anything like that happening. There may be in other aspects of Islamic history. I don't think there is in the history of medicine specifically. Um, but yeah, a lot of it depends on us and the conversations we initiate, right? And how much we choose to learn for ourselves and then share with others. Um, and uh, that hopefully will have a uh, ripple effect in terms of how we start to explore um, uh, this, how we as Muslims and how historians of medicine and how medical practitioners in general all start to explore uh, this history in more detail. Thank you for your excellent answer. And again, thank you so much, Jazakumul Khair, for the excellent presentation. Um, I, we wanted to just end off this session here with a short reflection. Um, so thank you all for coming to today's event. We've witnessed how throughout history, Muslims have contributed to medicine and shaped the practice even in its present day. Today, Muslims lead COVID task forces. They are CTV news infectious disease experts. They are world-renowned ophthalmologists. They have authored our textbooks. They are the founders of medical nonprofits and they continue to serve our patients. One in three Muslim post-secondary graduates are pursuing a career in STEM. One in five Canadian Muslim women are in STEM. We have a contribution to make. We continue to contribute and we are here to continue to leave our legacy. I want to thank you all for coming here today to learn about this often neglected part of our history. I implore you to think critically about not only about what you are learning, but what you are not learning. Let's all continue to work together, learn from one another, and take on the challenges of tomorrow, not simply as individuals, but as a collective. So again, thank you so much to our guest. Um, if you wanted to stay connected with his work, um, he mentioned his blog, which is www.ihistory.co. He's also active on Instagram at hassam.history and on Twitter at capital H Hassam, capital M underscore. And below that, you see the Facebook pages for both MMAQ and WIM. Both groups host great events throughout the year and I encourage everyone to check them out. With that, we will conclude our event, inshallah. Again, I want to re-emphasize how grateful we are both to Hussam Hilal for reciting, Brother Hassam Munir for speaking, and to all of you for attending. Barakallahu fikum, wa jazakum allahu khairan, wa alaykum. Have a great night, everyone.